This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, Community Radio for East Central Illinois. Streaming live at www.weft.org. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Weekend Heartbeat, a series of shows that represent a collective effort to bring the thoughts and actions of people working in the nonprofit arena to the forefront where it needs to be. Join us each Saturday at this time to enjoy a different episode in this series. Upcoming shows will include Joy George, the first Saturday of each month, hosting Peace Talks Radio, which talks about the personal conflicts we face every day and ways we may effectively deal with these challenges. Also in this series is Doug Olive, the third Saturday of each month, who will be hosting Speaking of Democracy, which takes a look at political theory and its sociology. Another in this series is Pause Radio on the fourth Saturday of each month, which is an informative program on the care and well-being of our companion animals. Today's show, A New Lamp, features Marilyn Rickey and Sean David, who will be bringing an informative light to the Baha'i faith and its philosophy. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WEFT, its board of directors, associates, station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program is pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part is a rebroadcast of a program first aired in 2011. The second part was recorded in November 2014. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp for Old. New lamp for old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dented tarnished lamp? And in the market he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks.
Hello again. I finished last week's program by saying we would talk about progressive revelation, and so we shall. The essential truth of the divine religions is one truth and springs from one eternal source. Each new religion has two objectives. The first is to reaffirm the truth of the one and only God and to remind us of how we are to treat one another. These two essentials never change. However, as humankind has progressed over many millennium, so the requirements of each age have changed. Today's world does not even begin to resemble the world of 4,000 years ago. So the rules become outdated and need upgraded to meet the needs of the present time. These are the roles of the manifestations of God, to reinforce the essentials and update the non-essential laws. The universe and everything therein is in cycles, wheels within wheels, always moving and progressing. A simple illustration is the seasons, winter to spring, spring to summer, and so on. Rebirth, full flowering, deterioration, dormancy. So with religions. Each one has struggled to take its place in the world, its founders and followers persecuted. But growth takes place until it becomes the regeneration, or resurrection, if you will, of the spiritual world to mankind. Centuries passed and the enthusiasm wanes as it gets less of a struggle, taken for granted, reinterpreted, superstitions rise, and then comes the decline. Then comes the next manifestation of God, to once again suffer, to revive the spirit of mankind with the holy fragrances of a new spiritual flowering. This we refer to as progressive revelation. Each messenger of God, before leaving this world, promises that another will come in due course of time. All the messengers of God are imbued with the same spirit. Each reveal to us the true nature of God to the extent that we mortals are able to comprehend. The names are different, but the spirit and purpose always the same. To return us to a compassionate God and revive the spiritual life of mankind. By the way... Please understand that the use of such words as man or mankind is simply because our English language does not have adequate gender-neutral words and is clumsy in that regard. I am always referring to both male and female unless it is obvious that I am referring to one or the other. So, who have been the manifestations of God? They include Abraham, Moses, Buddha, Zoroaster, Christ, Muhammad, and others through unrecorded history. For whom are you waiting? The Messiah, if you are Jewish. The return of the Buddha. The return of Christ, if you are Christian or Muslim. May I present to you Baha'u'llah, the fulfillment of all prophecy, the promised one of all the ages. Yah Baha'u'llah, thou glory of the all-glorious.
The sun of reality, like the material sun, has numerous risings and dawning places. One day it rises from the zodiacal sign of Cancer, another day from the sign of Libra or Aquarius. Another time it is from the sign of Aries, as it diffuses its rays. But the sun is one sun and one reality. The people of knowledge are lovers of the sun and are not fascinated by the places of its rising and dawning. The people of perception are seekers of the truth and not the places of its appearance nor of its dawning points. Therefore, they will adore the sun from whatever point in the zodiac it may appear, and they will seek the reality in every sanctified soul who manifests it. Abdu'l-Baha Thanks so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is a new lamp at yahoo.com. Thanks and have a great day. Good afternoon, and welcome back to this portion of A New Lamp. Hey, Sean, look who our guests are today. Hey, it's my mom and dad. Hi, mom and dad. Hello. That's right. We welcome Sean's parents, Joan and Carlton Mills. We're so delighted to have you with us today. Oh, we're glad to be here. Being Sean's parents, we have a lot to answer for. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't been on the radio since my college days. Well, you two have uh, such an interesting history. But first, let's hear a little bit from each of you about the early part of your lives, where you hail from. Let's start with Joan. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I studied mathematics and chemistry in undergraduate school at Spelman College in Atlanta, and math and statistics and educational psychology in graduate school. My job had me working with the university computers early on, and I studied horticulture at Parkland College. I like plants. But my real love is ancient history, including archaeology, metaphysics, and, of course, religion. You've got a lot of good interests there, Joan. (laughs) So you started originally from Atlanta and somehow rather ended up here in Urbana and uh, found the Baha'i faith. I continued attending services at the Adventist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist, and Vineyard later after I came here. When I didn't find what I was looking for in these churches, they are really quite a bit alike. I meditated with the Buddhists, studied with the spiritualists, and taught at the School of Metaphysics after studying their program. I found in late high school, early college, it was more interesting to read metaphysics and world religions than learning the latest dance steps. In those days, before internet, you had to be reading or mixing with people going out to find out these things. To make a long story shorter, my girlfriend, who liked religion and philosophy, helped me get a scholarship to do junior year abroad. And her one letter to me said she had found Baha'i. Well, I got home. My girlfriend, who wrote the letter, still didn't tell me much, except that there was a teaching meeting in a white neighborhood, I believe near Emory University, and she loaned me a book, a difficult-to-read book. I was glad when I could get to the Black Baha'i Center in a black neighborhood near Martin Luther King Jr. Church. The next thing I knew, my girlfriend was a Baha'i. She married a white Baha'i man who became a college professor. 
I went to that teaching meeting once or twice, and although it was a little icy, I did go to an out-of-town Baha'i gathering riding in an integrated car, which my dad thought was a really dangerous thing to do. This was in early 1963. Sit-ins were going on in Atlanta under M.L. King Jr., but I was already fully integrated. When I came to Illinois for grad school, I thought I'd try the Adventist one more time. I found the address in the phone book. I rode my bike. It took a lot longer than I allowed, and I arrived late. They directed the latecomers into a mother's balcony that was soundproof and on an intercom system. After about half an hour, the sound went out. That was my sign. I should go. I didn't need to listen to any more preachers that all sounded alike if I didn't want to. I could go where there were many books written by the Baha'i founders. Maybe I could finally get more spiritual answers and ride in integrated cars that didn't scare me. Uh, so we found the Baha'i faith and, and found that it was integrated. So, uh, Carlton, let's hear a little bit about your early life. Uh, I'm sort of the opposite. I grew up on a farm in northwest Illinois, which is a part of Illinois that is <laughs> has hills and is not flat. Um, it's, Wisconsin sort of sticks itself in. <laughs> um, I actually went to a one-room schoolhouse for my first eight years of schooling. Mm -hmm. um, and my high school uh, uh, had 125, 130 students, and my graduating class was like 25. Uh, and but in, even though it was a tiny school out there, uh, we you could still take Latin. Um, the Latin teacher quit about the same time I graduated, and they never replaced him. Um, so, but I got you know a reasonable uh, high school education. I came down here studying uh, agricultural engineering and got uh, interested in, in computers. And I had a friend, a Baha'i friend. Um, in my rooming house, who was sort of insistent that I come to some of the meetings and things. So I, I became involved with, with the Baha'is that way. And I thought, um, at the time, I was pretending to be an atheist. Um, <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, I, 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 accept, I actually accepted Baha'u'llah, I think, sort of instinctively. But it was difficult to overcome the Christian background or prejudice of that Jesus is somehow totally distinct from all the other messengers. Um, you know, in, in, I grew up in a Presbyterian uh, environment, mm -hmm. and they they uh, they were not they were not narrow-minded or or dogmatic really, but you you absorb the reality from their point of view. Right. The only thing that was uh, which may have helped getting me to be a Baha'i was I was. Uh, in our communicants class at the church, um, my father was on the session, uh, which is a governing body in, in the Presbyterian church. And so session members were supposed to go and, and watch the final exam of, of the communicants before they joined the church. And they could ask questions. So my father asked a question to the effect of, well, if, if Christ has brought a new covenant, does that mean you don't have to obey the Ten Commandments? Your father asked this. My father asked that, uh -huh. which was the question. first time, I think, in the whole communicant class experience that there was anything with any intellectual value. And the minister sort of made some blah, blah, blah thing to avoid actually discussing uh -huh. the implications of that. But that may have just stuck around and uh, caused me to be more accepting of, of of Baha'u'llah when I heard about it. And I spent like a summer sort of in agony uh, because I wanted to be a Baha'i. or felt, I felt I should become a, a Baha'i because Baha'u'llah was who he said he was. So it was, I knew that and it was my duty to do that. But that would require that I at least pretend to be, you know, a responsible adult. And, and I... I was just turning turn 21, and I felt <laughs> it was time for me to sow some wild oats. And this ah. would end up the sowing of wild oats. So finally, uh, in September, I uh, declared at a uh, meeting in Champaign. Mm -hmm. And that Sunday, Joan declared. After some of the meetings, uh, 
we uh, I asked Joan to go to have coffee and and pie on Goodwin near where in, in restaurants where where the uh, Cranert Center performing arts arts are. Ah, okay. And, and so that's when that's when we started to get to know each other, and. Something happened, and which I don't quite understand. But the next June was we were married. So something happened. Something he happened. Understand. Yeah, yeah. Right. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> 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 well, now this really is interesting. We've got a black lady from the uh, big town of Atlanta in the Deep South, and a white man from rural mm-hmm. Northern Illinois. So, okay, you've explained to us how you met. Uh, <laughs> you, you've, you've had some pretty exciting times. So when this happened, back in the 60s, uh, it was a time of racial crisis in this country, uh, which was a pretty daring move on your parts. Uh, did you run into a lot of trouble because of your mixed uh, racial relationship? How did your families respond? Her father sent a letter up saying that he'd never met a good white man yet, oh. but that maybe this is the one God put in his, his uh, path. How interesting. Yeah. Uh, Joan's, father, Joan's family sent uh, uh, Joan's sister up to find out just what kind of weird mess their daughter had got into uh-huh. up here at the, at the big U of I. Um, and uh, th- there's different opinions about whether she was really a spy or not. But if you have something to say, Mom, go <laughs> ahead and speak up. <laughs> <laughs> we have this script, and he's not following it. <laughs> he's already skipped one of my speeches, and he's about to skip a second one. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. And, and Sandy did come up to see what was going on, right? Am I totally... It's, no, she came up. Uh, yeah, she came up. Yeah, I think she came up for a visit before she came up to stay for a semester. Yeah, right. Which was shortly after. But was she up here to spy? (laughs) My mom's rolling her eyes. (laughs) (laughs) Just Uh, checking things out, kind of. She never let on. She was just enjoying a vacation. Um, Probably the first time she left home by herself. Mm-hmm. She was. She's eight years younger than me. No. So she was in her teens then, probably. Yeah. Probably in high school. Yeah. So Carlton, how did your family respond? Um, they were okay. Uh, initially, they sort of had to be ca- be okay for uh, psychological reasons because they knew there was nothing. You know, everybody was was human and created by God, <laughs> and I, being young and crazy. I uh, told them I was bringing a girl home, but I didn't for them to meet. But I did not tell them that the girl was black, and so they met me in Savannah, Illinois, as so we get off the train, and here comes this, this, you know, this girl I brought from from the university, and uh, she she was black. But they were cool, and I don't think anybody, you know, really said anything about it. Um, I asked my mother what she thought of Joan, and. She, she said, well, the kids like her, which was <laughs> to, I mean, she, she, she was a, a mother who, who really liked children. I'm the oldest of 10. And so for oh every my. two years, we had a new baby. And um, so somebody who gets a lo- the highest praise you could get, uh, other than getting an A in Latin, which I don't think I ever did, was to be a good baby tender. Uh-huh. And so Joan's instincts to... Uh, cuddle up with the children was absolutely the right thing to do. Oh, hey, how about that? So essentially, uh, both of your families accepted what could have been a big problem. So you both became Baha'is about the same time? Yeah, actually the same time. Oh, okay. In the Baha'i community, uh, what was their reaction to the mixed marriage situation? I didn't realize at at the time but they looked at it as a positive thing that, and it is part of the faith that, that to have diverse marriages of diverse backgrounds of, of, from different parts of the world and, and different classes um, 
and at the very beginning here in a, in the United States, a um, a black um, lawyer, Louis Gregory, uh-huh. married a, an English Baha'i, with with the absolute blessings of the son of son of Abu Baha, and that sort of settled, settled the race question for the Baha'is in the United States right. when that happened around the time of World War One. I. I have a, a question, Joan. I was kind of curious about. Uh, you said that when you were still in the South and you went to a Baha'i meeting, that it was a black meeting. Uh, was that typical at that time? Well, the laws, <laughs> this was before the sit-ins, mm-hmm. or before the sit-ins had any effect, um, <clears throat> and the laws did not condone too much okay. interaction except maybe servants. Right. Um, so it would have been asking for trouble to be integrated at that time. That's what my dad thought, and mm-hmm. it didn't occur to me, <laughs> except after he spoke, then I started to get more cautious. But I had been to meetings in the white neighborhood before. I went to a Quaker meeting that was an ongoing every week study group mm-hmm. uh, in the Quaker house that was across town. So being in Martin Luther King's neighborhood, church neighborhood, was well thought of place to be. This uh-huh. was not in the boonies. This was not a peripheral thing. And this was a special place to be there. There was a white community. I never met them. Hmm. When my dad found out I had joined Baha'i, he went directly to the white community <laughs> and got to know some of those people and joined up really? and became <laughs> and stayed Baha'i for the rest of his life. Oh, and my goodness. I never the, knew that, John. representative of the Baha'i community came to his funeral. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so he didn't deal with the black community. But I liked the singing, and I had met... Uh, my friend's friend, the friend who had been helping me all along, had a, f- um, had a friend who was this pianist. And she could just play anything she had heard. And she made that black meeting really special. <laughs> I didn't want to find anything else. <laughs> In fact, it sort of reminded me of uh, going to the Adventist church when I was in summer school between uh, grad, undergrad and graduate school in another state, not m- my home and not Illinois. And I went to the white Adventist church and it was as if I was invisible. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Nobody spoke to me except this one young mother who invited me to her house and she fed her, me and her children peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought that was kind of neat. That is neat. Uh, but <laughs> race relations were very strange. <laughs> yes, I, I'm i sure it has to have been. <laughs> and Joan, you had a friend that introduced you to the faith? Yes. Um, this was a friend from high school. Um, we like to talk kind of uh, philo- philosophical, metaphysical mm-hmm. baby talk, really. I mean, we didn't know anything. She knew that I was interested in religion. So when she found out about Baha'i, she wrote to me because we were in separate towns at the time and told me that when I came home, she would tell me about Baha'i. And (laughs) it's funny. She literally never told me anything about Baha'i. It's cute. But Hmm. um, she gave me a book or loaned me a book. It was very difficult to read. <laughs> okay. I didn't get it. But I knew there were books now. There were lots of books, I've been told, and I was ready to find all of them. <laughs> all right. Um, so I found a book that really drew me in that was taking off where the Adventists had left off, um, describing the biblical prophecies of the return. Right. Um and it was written by a Baha'i who was very vocal. He was into radio and um, very interesting. Huh. And I absorbed that book. 
it just confirmed what I had been studying, what I'd been learning, what I'd been hoping about religion. And when I got to Urbana and explored the Urbana Baha'i Center, they had shelves of books. Uh-huh. And I got started collecting. <laughs> uh-huh. I was a student. I didn't have a lot of money. But then books were a lot cheaper in those days. <laughs> right. Everything um, was a lot cheaper in those days. <laughs> and they had some lending <clears throat> materials. That's great. And today, as we're recording, we're sitting in a Baha'i library. Yeah. So this is pretty neat. Yeah. <clears throat> that book was by uh, Bill Sears. Yeah. Oh, um, is that it, the, the book? And um, I can't think of the name right now. Thief it's in the Thief Night. Thief in the Night. Thief in the Night, yeah. Thief in the Night, which is, which is about prophecy. I yeah. think a lot of people have come into the faith because of reading Bill Sears' book, A Thief in the Night. Yeah. Or, or the, what is it, the, the, right. uh, the, the Thief in the Night? Case of the Missing Millennium. That's, that's what it is, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the first part of our program today was about progressive revelation. Uh, to me, when I learned about this Baha'i belief, it just seems so logical, like almost obvious. Why doesn't everybody know this? Uh, how did this affect your decision to become a, a Baha'i? Was it a, a new idea to you, the idea of progressive revelation, that there have been uh, messengers from God periodically? I accepted it without <clears throat> paying much attention to the name. Mm-hmm. Like people start... In my memory, people started using the words progressive revelation a few years after be- I became a Baha'i. It's okay. probably not true. It's just a matter of, of faulty memory. But I, you know, once you accept Baha'u'llah, then you have accepted progressive revelation because, well, it's because you've accepted this idea that we're, we're moving forward and, the, and this, that this is, the, this is the time of the end, but it's also the... the New beginning and and that the the Lord's prayer of where we will you know Thy will be done Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven um, that you know that's part of the process that a Baha'i endeavors to to advance. Yes, and those of us who have come from Christian background are aware of the idea of the uh, mil- the golden age, the millennium that right. is supposed to be one of peace, and uh, so this is, and it, it all makes sense, right. doesn't and that's, it? That's, it turned, that's sort of a universal, <clears throat> other religions have the same kind of, of, of vision for the future. Yes. And, and the, the previous prime minister of Iran, when he spoke at the United Nations, always ended up speaking about the coming Mahidi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who would lead the world to peace and to justice. Mm-hmm. Yes, he and, did. And so, I mean, at the same time, he's he's trying to get rid of the Baha'i faith because he thinks it's not a religion. Um, but he is talking about the same as the as the Lord's Prayer. He's talking about the future. That's right. He's just you know slightly off. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Joan? Did you uh, find progressive revelation an interesting concept, or did that make sense to you? Well, given that I had been studying with the Buddhists, um, I read about other religions, mm-hmm. and it seemed perfectly reasonable that they were all inspired by a d- divine teachers at some level. Um, and we we knew we know that um, Jesus was a Jew, <laughs> so that. His background, his early teachings from his family were all Judaism, and so that was his launching pad, so to speak, to become the teacher of Christianity. Right. Um, He couldn't have done that without a background. And, and of course, we probably also know that um, Buddha was born into Hinduism, Right. So Mm -hmm. these teachers are launched by their parent religion, so that they can go ahead and go further than that because of their divine inspiration that they get as a manifestation. 
Uh, so this has been interesting. Uh, Carlton, in our religion, the Baha'i faith, we don't have any clergy. Now, doesn't this kind of lead to everything being a bit at loose ends? I mean, how can we function that way? Uh, can you give us a description of how the faith is kept together? What sense of organization prevents it from just falling apart? Well, when Joan and I became a Baha'i in uh, 1963, the administrative, what the Baha'is call the administrative order, which is uh, an embryo of what will develop over the coming centuries, was quite simple. Uh, the fairs of a community were governed by a local spiritual assembly and it was elected by the members of that community. It was nine people. The affairs of a nation were uh, directed by a national spiritual assembly, another group of nine people. And in 1963, just three or four months before we became Baha'i, the Universal House of Justice was elected for the first time. And that's another nine people that are working on the affairs of the world. And the Universal House of Justice is referred to by Baha'u'llah. He spoke of Baha'u'llah. I mean, Baha'u'llah spoke of the of the Universal House of Justice. And he explicitly deferred decisions to the Universal House of Justice. And people would ask him questions, and, and Baha'u'llah said that it would be decided in the future. That there, there were things, administrative kind of things, mm -hmm. that he refused to say anything about. He said that that will be taken care of in the future. So we've always been sort of a future-leaning community. We've always been building something. What's going on is imperfect and not good enough, and it's, we, we are in the process of replacing it with something better. And we're doing our best not to encumberment with the bad ideas of our current civilization. Um, so the the big thing when you look at it, say, from a sociological point of view, is one, there is no administrative authority given to an individual. So there is nothing like a, a pastor or a priest or, or a high priest or an imam that has authority to compel people to do things. There's no individual that has that. All individual, all authority, administrative authority resides in the local spiritual, in the in the spiritual assemblies, and that in itself is sort of distinct from the world. Yes. Uh, the world, we we want people to, you know, the president appoints czars to do this and that, and and we want individuals to to actually do things and then we want to yell at him at the individual and make his life as difficult as possible <laughs> and if it doesn't work out well then we want to say i told you so and we well, want then, to we want a cult of personality also right yes you know, we want to have an individual that we want look to, to to lead us to be our uh to be our conscience for us right and that's yes. something that uh with nine elected individuals it doesn't really work that way. Right. You also have, if the preacher didn't say to do it that way, then you don't have to. You did, it's not required. You don't have to use your own brain to realize you shouldn't be bad-mouthing your neighbor. Right. <laughs> uh, so it, we are all responsible then. We're mm -hmm. responsible for our own spiritual development and behavior. And the authorities help in in their way, they make like this Baha'i Center available because mm -hmm. no one person could have done this in the Baha'i Center, in the Baha'i community here. Uh, we're not that rich. We're not that powerful. <laughs> we're just <laughs> working together to make something happen. And the more Baha'is we get, the more helpers there are going to be, and it'll be wonderful. <laughs> oh, won't it, though? Well, but the co accompanying this is, is the process of creating these institutions. Yeah, the, uh, the you know traditional thing is you can go in an organization and you can you can find if you're ambitious you can find a path to get to the top, uh -huh. and if you want to do something you find you create a little click to support you in doing whatever it is you want to have done to fix things up. In the Baha'i faith, the local spiritual assemblies uh, we gather on a Baha'i holy day, we say prayers. 
people write down the names of the nine people they think most qualified. And the qualifications include such things as, as a well-trained mind, disciplined people. Who are the who are the competent people? And you vote for them. There are no nominations. There are no speeches, and the process itself sort of s causes the people who want to make speeches and move themselves up the hier hierarchy are, you know, rejected. They they get pushed out at every election because the electors are going to say, well, somebody that egotistical, you know, I don't want him mm -hmm. or her. And and the process also makes you have diversity of people on the assembly because you're, you're choosing nine people rather than, than just one. And the basic rule is if there is a tie and one of the people is a member of minority, the person on the minority is always put on. There's, you don't have to have a vote to break the tie in that case. That's interesting, isn't it? So that, that sort of symbolically places the idea of protecting the interests of the minority, making sure that the minority doesn't feel that, that they're being shoved out. Right. But there comes with that what, the, what we as citizens of the community have to do. We have to accept the decisions of the assembly and support them. The same as the members of the assembly, if it's not unanimous, when they vote and decide, that decision is the decision of the assembly, and everyone is honored bound to support that. So there are no minority positions. There are no splitting into groups fighting uh -huh. things out and saying, well, if those that was a dumb decision and those people who voted that way didn't know what they were doing. Well, it's possible they didn't know what they were doing. But within the Baha'i system, everybody's honor bound to support the decision. If it doesn't work out, it can be fixed. And because you have not gone and stuck your ego and tied your ego to a what turns out to have been a bad decision, uh -huh. it makes it easier to change, to, to correct it. How often are these assemblies elected? Uh, once a year. And same for the National Spiritual Assemblies. The Universal House of Justice is elected every five years. And the, the electors for the Universal House of Justice are the National Spiritual Assembly members. Okay. And, and the uh, headquarters of, of the Baha'i Faith is in Haifa in Israel. So every five years... There's about 170 uh, spiritual assemblies around the world. So every five years, the people of Haifa get to see, you know, 10,000 Baha'is <laughs> coming from all over the world, some of whom have never been on an airplane before. But they, they were elected to the, yes. to the National Spiritual Assembly, and so now they're coming to Haifa to, mm -hmm. for the international convention and to vote. And when they vote, um, everybody wears their native costumes. So it's interesting to watch the newsreels of, you know, you'll have a headhunter. You'll have yes. somebody from Indonesia. You have, you know, Indians. <laughs> I trust they're not still headed. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But you, <laughs> right, yes, right. But you, but you will, you know, meet Baha'is or, or that say, well, you know, my families were headhunters. But the same principles uh, abide, that there's no electioneering. The members of the House of Justice just sort of disappear, and you don't see them until the vote. There's no statements that made by anybody. Uh -huh. um, there are, in the meetings, people will be designated who are not members of the Universal House of Justice to greet them or to make a certain talk or do something. But then, once the Universal House of Justice is elected, then all of a sudden they're out and they're greeting their old friends. And, and sure. what is really interesting is that you can still think of them as, as, as friends. Um, mm -hmm. I've been on a first-name basis with like three members of the House of Justice over the last half century. Wow. And, it, and it's, uh, I was, unfortunately, I didn't have my camera, but at, at a high school in Flint, Michigan, uh, we give people duties, service. You have to do service. So you have to, on Saturday, people between A and uh, H, mm -hmm. they clean up and do the tables at noon, and then the, the <laughs> other half cleans up the tables at, at, for the after the evening meal. And I was there, and I looked over, and there's a member of the Universal House of Justice doing his duty, and he was cleaning off the tables. Mm-hmm. Everybody on the same level. Everybody, you know, but you know, he, and he wasn't being ostentatious about it. And it wasn't, right. 
um, because other times they'll crowd around his table and ask questions. So he doesn't have any chance to do it. He just spends his time with the friends. But, but I, you know. Well, you know. thank you so much for explaining all this, Carlton. This is, is uh, really interesting, and you've given us a good account of, of how the Baha'i faith is organized. Uh, so, See. Joan and Carlton, we've learned about how you met, about your early background, how you became Baha'is. Uh, okay, anything else we need to know about your marriage or your family? Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, four children. One was adopted, and the other three came the old-fashioned way. Um, <laughs> so, Sean, mm -hmm. your dad mentioned that, what, three of you are born of your mother? Right. And the fourth one has been adopted. That's right. Tell yeah, my, my older brother, uh, Bobby, <clears throat> he's an uh, electrician in town. Uh, my sisters uh, both live in Geneva, Illinois. Um, Kathy is... School nurse. She's a school nurse. Yes, mm. I was trying to remember if she was still working there at the school. Uh -huh. uh, she's had a long career as a nurse, and she's worked in various, uh, various settings. Before she was a school nurse, she was a labor and delivery nurse. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Rana uh, is now living in Geneva also with uh, her daughter. And... Uh, Rana's working for the... She does the produce for an upscale grocery store. Hmm. And you go in and look at it, and she's got the stacks of apples looking beautiful. <laughs> and she has a little knife she carries around, so if you're interested in how something tastes, she'll pull it off and, and slice oh, off a, a piece for you. But what's really amazing is how beautiful vegetables and fruits can be when an artistic person stacks them up. Picture perfect. Huh? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really sharp how, how Rana she has Rana studied it. art, uh, drawing, and dance, and so she is... Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's always been the family artist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else we need to know about your marriage or your family? Uh, we have five grandchildren, Oh, that's that's worth mentioning. Um, Kathy has two, Rana has one, and Bobby has two, but we don't get to see them <laughs> because of the divorce. Oh gosh, divorce is really divorce a, is uh, bad. <laughs> yes, it is. And unfortunately, it's something that plagues every family anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for coming and joining us today. It's been a real delight having you here with us. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I know you're proud of your parents, Sean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're proud of our son. It's amazing how he brought his equipment and microphones in and turned the library into a sound studio. I mean, <laughs> Isn't it great? Yes. <laughs> so uh, would you folks be willing to share with us some of the Baha'i readings? Be we willing to disperse some music with those? Oh, that is just great. So, okay, well, thanks again.
manifestations of God have each a twofold station. One is the station of pure abstraction and essential unity. In this respect, if thou callest them all by one name and doth ascribe to them the same attributes, thou hast not erred from the truth. Even as he hath revealed, no distinction do we make between any of his messengers. For they, one and all, summon the people of the earth to acknowledge the unity of God and herald unto them the river of an infinite grace and bounty. They are all invested with the robe of prophethood and are honored with the mantle of glory. The other station is a station of distinction and pertaineth to the world of creation and to the limitation thereof. In this respect, each manifestation of God hath a distinct individuality, a definitely prescribed mission, a predestined revelation, and specially designated limitations. Each one of them is known by a different name, is characterized by a special attribute, fulfills a definite mission, and is entrusted with a particular revelation. Even as he saith, some of the apostles we have caused to excel over others. To some God hath spoken, some he hath raised and exalted. And to Jesus, son of Mary, we give, gave manifest signs, and we strengthened him of, with the Holy Spirit. The music on today's program were He Has Come Back and Ya Baha'u'llah Pa by the House of Worship Choir. Thanks for being with us today. Till next month, have a beautiful holiday season. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.